Once last he was first, and then once again last. His vision and eloquence ne'er unsurpassed. Call him hero or hypocrite, timid or bold. Toussaint Louverture was a man to behold. Round 1740, in French Saint-Domingue, a great Haitian leader surprisingly sprang from the loins of a woman enslaved far away, brought to work in a field, hauling cane night and day. For Toussaint from his birth was an item of chattel, or so said the French and the laws they did prattle, a system created to bleed the world dry, both the slaves and the soil on which they would die. And Haiti was special in all the wrong ways, for while any plantation deserved to be raised, Hispaniola alone was the end destination for a third of the slave trade's whole population. While descended from royalty back in Benin, now he lived the worst horror humanity'd seen. But he found constant hope in a man named Pierre, who taught him to read and to write with great flair. Now fluent and creole and French he would move to manage the fields so the yields might improve. Just months before Jefferson's famed declaration, Toussaint's manumission brought him liberation. No more were his services taken for free, he now was a salaried, choice employee. He became one of Haiti's free people of color, with resentment from one side, mistrust from the other. But his wealth kept on growing, his family did too, and retirement almost had come within view. He acquired his very own coffee plantation, and enough enslaved labor for smooth operation. But then came the year 1791. The revolt of the slaves had already begun. While at first far too timid to take up the fight, by year's end he decided to sit down and write. He appealed to great powers, especially Spain. He asked France that their prisoners would not be slain. His diplomacy forged new foreign rapports. He became Louverture. His words opened doors. And while once he was staunchly in full opposition, he'd come out in support of complete abolition. And so, when commissioners hailing from France proclaimed the Republic aligned with his stance, Louverture turned his back on his Spanish alliance and instead he turned inward to smother defiance. For the economy fully relied on plantations, but now they lay idle, devoid of all Haitians. To ensure that his coffers and war chest were stout, he had to ensure that the sugar flowed out. He fell back on coercion, and while they were paid, this wasn't the freedom for which they had prayed. By the end of the decade, he ran the whole show. Well, except for the lands ruled by André Rigaud. While Rigaud had an army with far better training, Toussaint was an expert in foreign campaigning. His lucrative trade deals and ample support meant André Rigaud would always fall short. The War of Knives lasted for over a year, its massacres filling the aisle with fear, and leading Toussaint's military machine, the increasingly famous Jean-Jacques de Sadine. It also was nice that Toussaint did perchance win exclusive support from the leader of France. He defeated Rigaud, then invaded the East. Those enslaved on the Isle now all were released. But Paris rejected his new constitution, because it forbade a key institution. For France was the nation of Bonaparte now. His ambitions were grand, and they could not allow for the unrivaled profits that slavery brought to submit to the notions for which he had fought. Louverture sent him letters. The case was well pled but Napoleon sent him an army instead. The new brother-in-law of the autocrat came to shut down the rebellion and set it aflame. While infectious disease hit the French forces hard, they kept pushing deeper and kept up their guard. At precisely the moment when all appeared lost, Louverture then discovered he'd been double-crossed. Dessalines and his men saw they'd too far to climb, and so they switched sides as to buy themselves time. While the French promised Louverture safety as well, they left him to die far away in a cell. While it took Dessalines still a year or two more, the French did give up, and their rule was no more. Louverture is a figure of grand contradiction, both great opportunist and man of conviction. He rose out of bondage and built worlds anew, but he also owned people as property too. In re the cliché that we all know by heart, revolutions will always end up where they start. While the leaders of Haiti were far from ideal, 
the enslaved freed themselves, revolutions are real. The unthinkable happened that can't be discounted. It reminds us there's nothing that can't be surmounted.